the central planning that caused the economic collapse will we'll get two, three trillion more of it as politicians allocate precious resources to allegedly fix the problem they created. And, and so we doubled down on the mistake of too much government, suffocating natural economic activity. It's my pleasure to welcome John Tamney to the show. He is director of the Center for Economic Freedom at FreedomWorks, senior economic advisor to Toronto Research and Trading, and editor of Real Clear Markets, and also a writer for Forbes. He is the best selling author of a book you probably know, which is entitled Popular Economics What the Rolling Stones, Downton Abbey, Le and LeBron James can teach you about economics. He's got several other books as well as a new one we're going to hear about today. And it's great to have him on the show. John, welcome. How are you? Hey, thank you so much, Jason. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's, it, great. it's a pleasure to have you. So tell us about your new book. Well, so the new one is titled When Politicians Panicked. Uh, this is another economics book. There will be lots of books written about health, uh, the, the, the science of the virus. Uh, my view is that this is an economic story. The virus has been spreading since uh, late fall of 2019. Uh, what happened in March of 2020 uh, was that politicians panicked. Uh, they chose economic desperation as a virus mitigation strategy. And so my book is the economic story, uh, how we went from a, uh, from a very healthy economy to something much less in a short matter of time, and how that was inimical to health outcomes or any kind of good outcomes. You, you, don't, you don't fix a virus by putting people out of work and businesses. So when you say that, it sounds like you're referring to the lockdowns more than the money printing, or probably both, but just tell us your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, without question, um, I'm referring to the lockdowns. I did, the idea that poverty or forced poverty or contraction fights virus just uh, it mocks history. If you go back to the 19th century, just as an example, uh, back then, if, we, if you broke your femur, you had one in three chances of death. But if you lived, your only option was, was amputation. If you broke your hip, you were going to die. Uh, back in the 19th century, you had as good of a chance of dying as living when you were born. Cancer was a certain killer, but see, we weren't advanced enough of a nation at that point to die of cancer. Most people were dying of tuberculosis and pneumonia well before they could contract cancer. And so what's changed? Well, what's changed is economic growth that produced resources that could be matched with scientists and doctors on the way to the elongation of life. Uh, John D. Rockefeller alone gave away 450 million just in his lifetime to medical science. And so the result was that suddenly Americans were able to die once, twice, three times, but live because they could survive what used to be a certain killer. Hmm. Oh, that, that's an interesting way to look at it, by the way. I, I appreciate that view of it. That's that's good. Yeah, no, it's, it, you know, and it just struck me as common sense that we, we've got this history. Uh, George Will was born in 1941, as I point out in the book. And when he was born, hospitals in the U.S., their, their biggest expense then was still bed sheets, linen, things like that. Medicine, even in the mid 20th century, was still very primitive. And so we're in, the, in a world now where they've come up with all sorts of answers and it's because of economic growth. And so why on earth with a virus spreading would you choose contraction? Uh, furthermore, what does contracting the economy have to do with uh, stopping the spread? Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I don't need to be forced to avoid sickness. I don't need to be forced to take precautions if something might kill me. Uh, it, just everything about what was done in 2020 just it defied basic common sense. Well, I mean, to play their side of the argument, of course, they're going to say, look, it's a highly contagious disease, right? And we've got to stop people from gathering to stop the spread. I mean, there's nothing, there's no rocket science about that. You know the arguments. So how do you argue against that, right? I mean, and listen, just so you know, I'm not, a, I, I thought this was largely an excuse to do a lot of draconian things. I've said many times, the pandemic is a dictator dream. 
right? It's like, yeah. it checks all the boxes they wanted, right? Every control box, you would, you know, track people, lock them down, all kinds of restrictions, dehumanization, just everything you want to do to people you can do. Start controlling the money, just a zillion things. But tell us more about your argument. Just ferret that out a little bit. It makes such a good point. And, and I agree with all that you say. It's as I point out in the book, what's that Randolph Bourne line that I know you're familiar with? War is the health of the state. Well, my argument in the book is that uh, crises are the state's oxygen if war is the health of the state. They just live for these manufactured scenarios because politicians, when they when they decree a crisis, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because the way that they deal with, quote, crises is they centralize all decision making as you right. command and control is the result. Well, if that always leads to crisis. We know that from good times. It doesn't you don't need a virus spreading to know that command and control results in crisis. And so but to answer your question, it, it's a great one and it's addressed in the book. Um, the virus was spreading. Didn't they have to do something? My argument is that the more threatening something is, the more life-threatening it's said to be, the more super superfluous forces. Again, who needs to be told not to, to, to avoid something that might result in death? They said, well, we're gonna shut things down for two weeks, likely story, because we wanna protect hospitals. But if my being out and about could result in me being in the hospital, I didn't need to be forced to do that. Um, are, are we joking? Um, who would need to be forced? And so what's, as, as I note in the book, it's just documented fact that long before the lockdowns began, Americans started adjusting their behavior. They stopped going out as much. They, they, they started wearing masks on their own. They started to wash their hands fastidiously. All the things associated with taking precautions in the states and the New York Times documented this, the states that locked down last, you know, the states that don't believe in science, it was in those states that the people started altering their lifestyles the most rapidly. They, they didn't need a law to be forced to avoid what might be harmful to them. You know, sadly, I mean, I want to agree with that, but you see a lot of these people out there, they're just there's just a lot of irresponsible people, you know? I mean, it's definitely not a very even thing, right? Uh, there are some people point. are very responsible and some people, you know, sadly, it's like, it's you just got to legislate stuff, it seems like. I hate to say that. I don't want to believe that. <laughs> but I don't think you do. Let, let me give you my pushback on that. I see your point, but my argument in the book is that the people who don't abide are every bit as important in fighting a virus as those who follow every rule. Think Tell us about that. Because, yeah, some people were, and you know them, I know them, locked themselves away without government force. They just were so afraid of this virus. Right. They still haven't been. They, I know people who still haven't been to restaurants since last February. Wow. You need people like that. Yeah. You need people who are taking all the precautions. Because let's find out, does, is that associated with less spread? Is that associated with better health outcomes? We know from New York that it's probably debatable. As of March of 2020, two-thirds of those hospitalized in New York had been sheltering in place. And so, you know, maybe or maybe not work. I, I mean, certainly it's not good for your immune system to be shut inside, right? Absolutely. That's not going to strengthen your immune system. So that argument flies for sure. I agree. Yeah, no, it, it's so interesting that you said it's not in the book, but recently I wrote about North Sentinel Island. Do you remember that from a couple of years ago? No. It's that island five off the coast of India. Uh, mm -hmm. Primitive people, they've been there for 50,000 years. And remember, they killed John Allen Chow, the Christian miss missionary. Who, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And why did they do it? They had no choice. He So isolated were they, they'd never been exposed to things. And so his arrival would have killed off the whole island. Mm -hmm. Chicken pox, measles, all that. Well, anyway. Yeah. And so, yeah, look, you need some people were going to shelter in place no matter what. But you need the people who throw caution to the wind. For my parents, my parents are old. They live in Pasadena, California. They and all their friends, very educated people, said, are you kidding? We grew up with polio and everything. They continued to live their lives, going to grocery stores, going out as much as they could, bridge club, not wearing masks. Well, you need people like that, old people. Does that associate with sickness and death? You also needed the young people to say, oh, we're still going to go to bars and make out, go to parties, do all the things that we used to do. 
because the people who don't abide produce information. Does that result in more sickness? Does it result in more death? Does it result in quicker spread? Because remember how little we know. You're old enough to remember AIDS. Remember how Anthony Fauci I put it, point out in the book, he wrote a, a paper in 1983 saying that AIDS was easily transmittable. Husband and wife just being in the same room didn't matter. They didn't have to be doing anything. In the same room? I don't. Yeah. I don't remember Fauci back in the AIDS days when oh, AIDS that's scare when was he, going on. That's when his fame began. Oh wow, interesting. Alarmist stuff yeah. about AIDS. Yeah. He was wrong. It doesn't make him bad. I think I speak for the both of us. We know that science. It's not science unless there's doubt involved. Mm -hmm. But he yeah. got AIDS very wrong. And so we needed free people living their lives to come up with the real answer about how AIDS was spread. And same, yeah. why would the virus be any different? You want the outliers, the idiots, because they produce information too. Yeah. Well, no one could disagree with that. Absolutely. But dive more into the economic angles, if you would. And if you want to touch on and bring on your book, Popular Economics, to just make the conversation a little more general about econ, that's what our audience is mostly interested in. So I want to make sure we touch on that. Oh, no, well, it's crucial. So we, you and I both agree the virus is a dictator's dream. It resulted in command and control. As economic thinkers, we all know the result. It's crisis, it's unemployment, it's businesses dying. And so bringing popular economics into it, what happens when you do this? So they bring about economic contraction, and then they say, oh, we broke it. So we're going to extricate $2.9 trillion worth of wealth produced first in the real economy from it to throw it our, at the problems we created. So basically, we overlay command and control onto command and control. The central planning that caused the economic collapse will we'll get two, $3 trillion more of it as politicians allocate precious resources to allegedly fix the problem they created. And, and so we doubled down on the mistake of too much government, suffocating natural economic activity. And so this, again, this is an economic story. They broke the economy, then they added on, and then they handed over to the Fed the power just to lend to businesses. Now, it turns out the Fed can't lend as foolishly as its biggest critics would say. The, the Fed can't go insolvent despite what people think. And so the Fed wasn't able to do much. But there's this view from both sides that, okay, businesses are struggling, so let the Fed just throw money at them. Right. It doesn't work that way. Businesses never run out of money. They run out of investor trust. You and I are old enough to remember that Amazon was Amazon.org forever. Book peddler, it could, it, but it couldn't be profitable. But investors stuck by it. And so the Fed throwing money at businesses was a non sequitur. Once you end the lockdowns, there was going to be plentiful capital. But with lockdowns, capital was going to not be plentiful, thus making government the only game in town. Again, to your point, a dictator's dream. We've destroyed the economy. And so if you want to maybe survive, you must come to us for your sustenance. Yeah, well, central planners and dictators love that type of thing. So what are your views on inflation? The estimates vary, John, but you know they say that 20 to 35% of all dollars ever created were created in the last year. I mean, that's just a staggering concept to even ponder. We're definitely seeing real signs of inflation, but is it going to get a lot worse? I tend to look at inflation in the way economists don't. Economists think inflation is about um, too much economic growth causing mm -hmm. uh, the economy to overheat. I reject that, and when politicians panicked, I reject it in my book, uh, Popular Economics. And my second book is titled, Who Needs the Fed? The notion that economic growth causes inflation is laughable. Inflation is a choice. Usually it's something that that presidents get because they oversee the US Treasury, essentially. Inflation is a devaluation of the unit of account. Historically, you used gold as the measure. And so to me, I don't listen to government measures of inflation because they've taken out of their measures what would rapidly indicate it. Think about it, in the 1970s, 
uh, we delinked the dollar from gold. That was inflation. The dollar went into free fall. We saw this in a rising gold price and rising oil prices. Same thing happened in the 2000s under George W. Bush when he got into office, a dollar about one two hundred sixty sixth of an ounce of gold. By the time he left, roughly one one set one thousands. That was the inflation. But CPI didn't report it. Because guess what? As you know, I'm telling you what you already know. They'd taken out food and energy, the commodities right. most associated, that the, are best. They started talking about the core rate or core inflation versus the CPI. And then, of course, they've manipulated the CPI like crazy. So we all know that's happening. But just the common person on the street knows that in the old days, you used to get single family home on a quarter acre lot, maybe on one income right? Just the man working. And and now you get much higher density and two people are working and they're still struggling, right? So it's obvious that there has been significant inflation in the system. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting that you say that, but let me give you some pushback. Because sure, I, go for it. Look, I'm with you. But to me, inflation is the devaluation of the dollar. But let's go back to 1983. Right. If you bought a mobile phone then, it was brick sized half well, hour. Te back. Technology is deflationary. You know, my well, first yeah. my first cell so, phone cost thirty two hundred dollars and it weighed fourteen pounds. Precisely. So I totally understand what you mean. But that's not fair to hedonically adjust things like that. Because what it's saying to me, John, when they do hedonic adjustments for technology, is that we are not entitled as people to progress. The index is entitled to all the progress. <laughs> I, mean, I love your point. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So, so look, I am with you 100%. I love how you put it, and I'm going to quote you on that, that implicit there is that we are not entitled to progress. That is right. so good. Yeah. I mean, I mean, listen, there is rational argument for hedonic indexing. I get it, right? You know, it makes sense. The computer I'm on was $2,800, right? You know, this every time I buy a new Apple computer, it's $2,800, but it keeps getting better. And so the index thinks I'm only paying half the price when it, the processor gets twice as fast. But the fact is, I'm still actually paying $2,800, you know? So these things are um, complicated right they are and and housing is a good example housing always shows the devaluation of the dollars and any surprise that in the 70s and 2000s housing soared that it was one of the top quote asset classes what do people do when currency is losing value they as von Mises said there's a flight to the real they rush into right. tangible ass mm -hmm. the wealth that already exists rather than investing in new ideas representing wealth, you know, stocks and bonds representing wealth that doesn't yet exist. Right. So I am with you. I, my frustration is that nowadays economists think economic growth, which I think speaks to your frustration, that we're not entitled to progress, that growth is the cause of inflation. We know that's not true. Devaluation of the dollar is. And so to me, I look at the gold price. Well, is inflation coming? No, no, no. It's been here for a while. A dollar bought one hundred one two hundred sixtieth of an ounce of gold in two thousand or two thousand. Now it buys one seventeen hundredth. Yeah, we very much devalued the dollar. And my question is, yes, we've seen progress, as I allude, as you know. But how much more progress would we have experienced if they'd protected the value of the dollars we earn? It's it's staggering to think about what we've missed out on. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. Who knows? And, you know, that's the thing, John. You can't hear the dogs that don't bark. So we'll never know how much better life might have been if we didn't have the central banks and the governments messing with the money in the economy, right? We'll just never know. It's a question you can, can't be answered. It's the unseen every time, yeah. you know, that's how you put it, we never know the dogs that don't bark, yeah. but the economic activity that did not occur. The other probably area of pushback is to me, money supply is a contrarian indicator. Uh, in post-World War I Germany, the mark was nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. it wasn't, what is not trusted does not circulate and it doesn't circulate because if I give you bad money for tangible items, you will go into the market and get much less for it. And so what circulated in, in post-World War I Germany were currencies like the dollar that were trusted. What is the currency of choice 
in, in North Korea, Iran, Venezuela right now. It is the dollar. Am, am I defending the, the Treasury's oversight of the dollar in total? No. But it is the most trusted of the currencies. And so it's maybe not as much of a surprise that, quote, dollar supply has gone up. It's the world's currency right now. Right. It's yeah. just it's always a compared to what question, right? And oh, yeah, no. And so but what I would say to you is imagine if I don't know if you're for a gold defined dollar or not, but let's just assume for fun. OK, we're going to redefine the dollars. I don't know. One one thousandth of an ounce of gold. I'm my, my guess to you is that the supply of dollars around the world would skyrocket to reflect the demand among producers around the world and workers around the world for something they can trust. Mm -hmm. And I think supply can sometimes uh, muddy, muddy understanding. Yeah, it sure can. Share with our listeners what we can expect in the future in any realm economically and what we should do about it. Well, I'm going to say what I expect currency-wise, and I'm hoping you'll comment and tell me if I'm nuts. My guess for all the reasons that you just have, and we both alluded to, the, the mismanagement of money in modern times, my guess is that markets are correcting for that right now. They obviously don't like it. Uh, $5 trillion worth of currency trading a day indicates that, that the markets despise the instability of, of floating money. And so my guess is that we're on the verge of private money, of JP Morgan dollars, dollars, currencies that are circulated that we trust, whereby I say I would prefer to be paid in JP Morgan dollars because they would never devalue the unit. And so my guess is that this private money, some call it crypto, is going to be the future as a market response to how disastrously governments have, have handled money in modern but Does that look like Bitcoin to you or, or what? No, because Bitcoin, at least at this point, reflects the dollar's uh, worst aspects just many times over. Um, how, how's that? Well, because uh, will you come remodel my kitchen? Um, I'll pay you three Bitcoin now, three in six months, three when you complete the job. And your logical question will be, well, what, which Bitcoin, the one that cost 250 in, in 2017, the one that cost 20,000 in 2019, or 20, 2019, the one that cost 60,000 now, what are you going to pay me with? And so my Bitcoin strikes me as a speculation as opposed to a, a currency. A currency is, is theoretically something that doesn't bounce around at all. It's, it's a stable agreement about value among producers. And so my guess is that markets bring us closer to that. Now, maybe Bitcoin ultimately its value stabilizes, in which case I'll be its biggest promoter. But I do think that's where we're headed simply because there is so much market effort on a daily basis to mitigate the horrors of floating money. That, that's a really interesting view. I would argue the opposite on the Bitcoin realm. And, and listen, I'm not a huge fan of crypto only because, and really only for one reason, and I've said many times, I would love to be wrong about this. But I just think that the powers that be, governments and central banks, are the most powerful entities the human race has ever known. They have standing armies. And once this stuff gets too big and takes too big of a hold, they're going to find a way to make it difficult, right? They're going to either tax it, regulate it, make it illegal, criminalize it. Who knows what they're going to do? But every country's widget is their currency, right? And so they want to defend their own currency. Why would they allow a competitor to the dollar, right? Unless it's Fed coin, unless it's their own competitor, right? Meant to replace it, which, by the way, you probably say that's where we're going, right? Do you think we're going to see a digital dollar or a Fed coin or something? Oh, I'm sure they'll try, but I, I'm just quite a bit more optimistic than you, as is the dollar is the world's currency. As yeah. is, even these these really tyrannical regimes around the world, the dollar is the currency of choice in North Korea. Anyone who's oh, yeah. got something of market value uses dollars. Same with Iran, same with Venezuela. They don't use the local currency. So and, and just so you know, I completely agree with you on that. You know, the yeah. dollar is the reserve currency, and I think it's going to stay that way for quite a while. But if if the new thing is published by the U.S. government, right, it's, if it's their thing, then it's the replacement of the dollar. It's a digital version of a dollar, right? So that's all I'm saying. It's, yeah, it's just and, a, and it's just a new model try. of the same thing. It's like printing a new version of the $100 bill, right? It's, you know, but yeah. much more complicated.
Yeah. No, I mean, but my book, Who Needs the Fed? I argue that the Fed's power is well overstated, that markets have been pushing it into irrelevancy for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Certainly think with this, that capitalism always outruns government. And mm -hmm. I do strongly believe that uh, the cat's out of the bag or what na na name your cliche, there's no way they can stop us now. There's no way they can stop the, the circulation of what's trusted as a medium of exchange. So it's going to happen no matter what. And, and uh, I think as a consequence, future growth is going to be staggering because you nail it. You say it's the dogs that didn't bark. What could we have achieved in the last 50 years if the dollar had been more of a credible measure or if we'd had private money 50 years ago? But we're headed there. And wow, when we do, think of all the movement of precious wealth out of inflation hedges. Think of all the movement of talent out of trading the chaos wrought by floating money back into real things. I think we're going to see a future that's going to stagger us. And one thing I'm focused on healthcare, not because I know anything. I keep hoping that economic growth soars because I want to live long enough to see the beautiful world that comes as a result of money being trusted again, such that there's a lot more investment in new ideas. Figure. So just, just so our audience understands kind of like where you're coming from, because I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure I, I get it. Are, would you be a gold standard guy? Are you a gold bug? Do you like gold? Um, let me put it this way. Why did producers around the world happen upon gold defined money? Well, they did because they tried everything else and gold was viewed as the most stable commodity when it came to, to measuring money, to defining money. Sure. It was the least uh, affected by world events and supply and, and, and buying and selling. And so I'm not so much for a gold standard as I'm for currency stability. And so I get why markets happen upon gold. Uh, people say, well, what should be next? And my response is, I don't know. I've got a supercomputer in my pocket. I don't know why I have this, but uh, capitalists produce this for me. If they can do that, they can produce a stable measure of value that producers trust and will use as a medium of exchange. And so while gold intrigues me, I don't care what they do. I just know that markets can create a better currency than can the US Treasury uh, uh, printing uh, Federal Reserve notes. And so Again, gold worked. To, to deny that it didn't is to ignore the five trillion daily in currency trading that is purely a consequence of, of, of currencies uh, being unmoored from something stable because there was very little currency trading before 1971. And when you refer to private money, which you've done several times, are you refer you know, in today's version of it, are you referring to various cryptocurrencies as the private money opportunities? Yes. Okay. And, and but my, my look, my speculation, which probably is wrong because the future is unknowable, it's my speculation that ultimately Amazon dollars, um, JP yeah. Morgan dollars, as of now, do you take a I, I just hate to see the idea of Jamie Dimon and, uh, you know, and a bankster running the money. I mean, that just scares me. I mean, Bezos is, can't be trusted either as far as you could throw them. But if they devalue you, you can you can say no more. I mean, that's the thing. The Chinese understood this back in this in this in this eighth century. Well, your argument is you can vote with your feet, right? Yeah, without it, question. Because the, the the argument among the Confucians back in the eighth century in China was, well, if government handles the money, they can devalue, and they can just devalue. If private entities are the creators of money, there's a market impact. There's a market response if they devalue. And so, right. you know, J P Morgan can't from a brand perspective, create a circulating medium and then just periodically devalue the holders of it. And that right. would describe Amazon, that would describe Target, that would describe Walmart, you name it. Because people will leave and there will be a capital yeah. flight. Yeah. If Treasury devalues, what do you do? Yeah. Well, they have market pressures because they don't have legal tender laws behind them. Right? Yeah. There's just, yeah. there's, the, you have to, you have to guarantee something. You have to be willing and, there, and the minute J.P. Morgan issues dollars, there will be insurance companies theoretically calling you and saying, hey, 
we will insure you against a devaluation. There will sure. be ways to protect yeah. yourself, uh, very easy market ways that you can't. I mean, look, you can hedge the dollar now. Everyone knows that, but it's it's kind of a high high economy uh, sort of thing to yeah. do. And so I think the options to protect our wealth will be much greater. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. John, give out your website or websites and tell us where we can learn more. Real Clear Markets is what I edit. I am at freedomworks.org, a wonderful organization where I do most of my writing from. Uh, you can find my books uh, on amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com and bookstores. Um, at John Tamney is my Twitter. Uh, I write usually three or four columns a week. Again, my latest book about the econ economic panic related to the virus is this one right here. So again, I'm very active and, and I'm very grateful that you invited me on. Um, at, I, obviously my views are somewhat unorthodox, but I think they've been- Oh better. no, we like that. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. We're not the mainstream media here, folks. So uh, yeah, we absolutely appreciate it. John Tamney, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me, Jason. I appreciate it. My pleasure.